Tukla for sharing with us his uh, experience uh, uh, and in uh, minimally invasive and the treatment of upper tract versus lower tract uh, uh, approaches for duplication anomalies. So, Professor Shukla, uh, the uh, audience uh, and podium is yours. So, please. Yes. Good evening. Salam alaikum to everyone, uh, Saudi pediatric urology and all that are watching this evening. I want to uh, thank Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Uh, um, I, I want to make sure I, I, Dr. Yasser, I can't pronounce the last name. I'll have to practice that a little bit. So, <laughs> Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Yasser. Uh, yes, Dr. Farhad, sir, is perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is really a pleasure uh, for me to join you all. Uh, I had an opportunity, I think, to be uh, during uh, a previous attempt of Saudi urology to give a few talks uh, a few years ago. Uh, and this is, gives me a chance to expand upon that a little bit and, and to continue our connections uh, between our societies, the AUA, my hospital, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Saudi Pediatric Urology. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, uh, duplication anomalies. Uh, and as you can imagine, this is a, a, bro a broad topic. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to go through the entire expanse of all areas of duplication and an anomalies. But we, you know, we can begin um, with uh, uh, a discussion just of the embryology, um, and, and then we'll get into the, uh, the topics that I'm going to focus on in this uh, talk today will be really ureterocele and ectopic ureter. If we can even just touch them a little bit, uh, we can make some progress, talking about, you know, lower pole UPJ obstruction or uh, other types of uh, anomalies may not be in the scope uh, of, of our talk today, but we can do that another time. So as we all know, and it's always good to just sort of, uh, you know, uh, go through some of the basic anatomy, uh, duplex system arises because of two ureteric buds. Uh, the 28th day of gestation, about four weeks, we get the mesonephric duct uh, putting out a ureteric bud. Sometimes we get that duplication anywhere between eight and 15% of the time. So that's not unusual. Uh, and then, as we know, uh, this gets absorbed, the, the mesonephric duct gets absorbed into the trigone or into the developing urogenital sinus. And as it's absorbed, because of the Weigert-Meyer rule, we know that the upper pole ureter uh, ends up more caudal and the lower pole ureter ends up uh, more rostral and lateral. Uh, and it's absorbed rapidly and more lateral while the, the distal one later. Uh, the upper pole later. Uh, and we know that the terminal portion of the mesonephric duct, the last point of that in the male is the epididymis, the vas, and the seminal vesicle. So you can end up with an ectopic ureter there. And in females, it's a Gardner's duct. Um, and the upper bud absorbs slowly with a long mucosal tunnel. So in males, it can end up in the posterior urethra, but never distal to the sphincter. While in females, it can certainly end up distal to the sphincter, anywhere up to the vestibule or the Gardner's duct. And so we worry when we have recurrent epididymal orchitis in a boy, in a small boy, prepubertal boy, having multiple episodes. One time you might say, okay, torsion of the appendix testes. Another time, okay, maybe a, a epididymitis. But you get more episodes, we know that something is not right. And we often will get an MRI to see what the heck is going on. And in girls, it's classic to get continuous incontinence. Now, when we look at the two that we want to focus on today, ureterocele and ectopic ureter, we know the ureterocele is due to persistence of the membrane that Chihuahua uh, described uh, at the terminal end of the ureteric uh, bud, uh, which fails to rupture, and then you have the membrane causing the obstruction. The prevalence is one in 4,000 females, much more than males. Now the ectopic ureter, as we mentioned, it can be in the Gardner's duct and that photo there uh, is of a girl, um, very similar girl I just saw yesterday uh, with an ectopic ureter, two month old girl, looked inside and looked exactly like that, a cyst that I ruptured, that I incised with a, uh, uh, a bug bee electrode and immediately urine came flooding out. So this we see in one in 40,000 births, male to female ratio, one to five. And then of course, 80% of the time is associated with a duplex system. Now, when we look at ureterocele, we're gonna talk about, this is a broad topic and I'm only gonna talk about it in a few slides. Otherwise we could talk for an hour 
uh, just about uridosil. But the goal, of course, when we're thinking about it is, okay, we wanna preserve renal function. We wanna prevent infections, urinary tract infections. So if we have obstruction, we wanna take care of that. We wanna take care of reflux uh, if that's leading to infections. And we want to avoid urinary incontinence. So those are, of course, the three things in any pediatric urologist, when, if we're talking about neurogenic bladder, we're also thinking about the same thing. Bladder extrophy, we're thinking about the same thing. Renal function, UTI, continence. That's our triad, right? So unfortunately, there are very few guidelines as to exactly what the best treatment option is. And the reason is, is that this writer, uh, who uh, sadly just passed away due to COVID complications this year, um, uh, Dr. Snyder, Howard Snyder, we've all heard the name. He was a giant in the field. And he's the reason I came to Philadelphia many years ago, 19 years ago, uh, to this hospital. Uh, and what he had taught us that if you see a ureter, There's a 50% on the contralateral lower, 50, a 10% chance that we'll have reflux into the ureter seal itself. Now, when we think about a ureter seal, we're often thinking, do I want to remove something? Do I need to reconstruct something? Or am I going to... continue to avoiding to incise or not to incise. We want to think about the upper pole function. Is it preserved and is it obstructed? Okay, is it just dilated or is, is there some function and there's an obstruction? Is there high grade re reflux that we're going to be having to deal with? Is it an ectopic then and extends out into the bladder neck? because that can cause some instability of the bladder neck and continence uh, repercussions. So when we think about should we incise it, uh, I'm going to think about incising uh, a ureter seal if all of those things are happening. If there's high grade reflux, if there's an ectopic ureter seal, if it's upper pole function, I don't think I'm gonna observe something like that. And so first step is going to be an incision. And if reflux occurs, we might think about a common sheath re-implant or an ipsilateral UU, which could be done at around 18 months of age. And we'll talk about that a little more. And if the ureter seal is small uh, and there's no reflux, you may consider just an IUU and no ureter seal incision. Or if there's no function in the upper pole, uh, or if it's a dilated non-functioning system, it's obstructed, then you might even talk about a partial nephrectomy, a hemi-nephrectomy, and we'll talk about that. So many things, when we say to incise or not to incise, what if we see something like this, okay? Here's a, a ureter seal uh, reflux into the lower pole. As I told you, that happens in 25% of the cases, and you can see that there's reflux on the contralateral side, so that happens in 50% of the cases, and you have the ureter seal. So now we know we have, and you see the drooping lily of that left ureter, right? Because of the fact that you have this dilation on top, and so that's causing that ureter to uh, to the bend down like a drooping lily, and then you might incise that. And then if you incise it, now you have high-grade reflux uh, into the upper pole. Guess what? The lower pole reflux often will go away when you obstruct, when you unobstruct the ureter seal, and the contralateral may go away, but now you have this high-grade reflux into the upper pole, which will then potentially raise a question. What if we have this? We have a ureter seal with a multicystic dysplastic kidney. Well, we have lots of data, multiple studies, including Copeland and Austin's very important study about 10 years ago, where they looked at 40 patients like that. And they showed that observation is acceptable for these small ureter seals because they're usually intravesical. And if they're associated with an MCDK, it gets better by itself. Oftentimes, a ureter seal will go away, and we'll talk about that. Now, there are two types of ureter seals, as we know, a single system ureter seal. This is a patient I just dealt with uh, uh, last week, or my practice, not me per
personally, that this is a came at around 12 vein, and an ultrasound showed that otherwise it was normal, but he did have a ureter seal, a single system ureter seal, an intravesical uh, 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 orthotopic ureter seal. So this patient, you know, you might uh, consider what are you going to do about that? Here's a duplex ureter seal, which is more common. Uh, where, you know, 80% of them are often associated with a duplex ureter. And so this is the more typical one that I think you'll be seeing that we'll be talking about during the case presentation. So we have these two classes and we have to think about which ones can we watch? When can we incise? Can we watch a duplex ureter seal? And here at CHOP, we actually are just completing a study that we'll be uh, presenting. So I'm giving you the first exclusive look. So if I don't have the data clear in my head, uh, this is uh, my partner, Arun Srinivasan, is uh, leading this study with a, our research team. Uh, and uh, he's looking at the conservative management of ureter seals. So we have, as a practice, uh, over uh, last uh, nine years, had 56 patients that we decided to watch. We didn't do anything about. Most of them were females, of course. Uh, you can see the age at the first visit. Most of them were from pre-antenatally detected hydronephrosis. Look at the uh, ureter seals. The ones we watched, 82% of them were intravesical. So if it's an extravesical, orthotopic, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, ectopic ureter seal, it's outside of the bladder or into the bladder neck, we tend to incise that because we don't think we're gonna always have very good uh, results. Now, some were ectopic, some were a pseudo-ureter seal, those were observed, uh, but in general, for an intravesical, we're gonna think about, hey, can I get away with that? And if there's an ipsilateral MCDK, then 30% you know, of them were like that. And then up to 40% of these were single system ureter seals. Now we know only 20% of all ureter seals are single system. We observe, so 40% of this cohort, it tells you that we tend to think about uh, observation in a single system intravesical ureter seal. Now, when we look at who succeeded and who failed conservative management, you can see again that the intravesicals overall did okay. 86% of, of them did fine. And MCDK, you know, uh, the, all of those that were MCDK, we were easily able to observe. They did not need to be incised. On follow-up, we saw that the ureter seal collapsed in 70% of them, remained stable in the other 30%. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was some uh, uh, stable function when we did renal scans in 66% of them. In six of these patients, we did have to intervene. Uh, and these patients, if you look, all of them were duplex systems. If we wash it with a duplex system, overall it was a low risk of needing to go back and incise, but single system, we never failed. Except for that case I showed you, who came with Dito's crisis, we did go and incise him. So, you know, every system is going to be a little different, but in general, a single system ureter seal, uh, uh, intravesical, Overall, you might be able to observe that and you don't have to jump right into treatment. And when we did have to treat our patients, uh, these were the common causes, reflux and breakthrough UTI, enlarging ureter seal, pain, bladder outlet obstruction. So we've talked a little bit there about ureter seal and thinking about the management, I did mention two things. One, we talked about observation. We talked about incision. And when it comes to reimplant or uh, whatnot, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's jump to ectopic ureters. Ectopic ureters are two to 12 times more common in females, of course, because duplex systems are more common in females. 80% are associated with the duplicated system with the upper pole moiety being the uh, proximate cause. Single system ectopia is more common in males and bilateral ectopia is a whole different ballgame that we won't be talking about because that can be associated with multiple significant anomalies in bladder neck incompetency. But the common one is the one that we see, right? This is a girl, uh, we see less of this to be honest now because of antenatal diagnosis. We see an upper pole hydro, hydro ureter and we tend to intervene earlier. But the, still a few will still show up every year will come in with leakage that hasn't stopped. Uh, and the mom is like, you know what? She's toilet trained, but in between she's always wet. What are we supposed to do about this? Well, obviously these are the patients who, um, you know, you can see there. Um, 
that we are, uh, you know, you, you're able to, on a BCUG, often what happens is that the catheter goes right into the ectopic ureter by accident, and you get a, you get a, a, a appearance of hydronephrosis when it's not hydro, when it's not refluxing. You're sorry, you get an appearance of reflux. So this is that classic picture of an upper pole hydro ureter dilation with a ureter, uh, with, sorry, with not a ureter seal, but this thick wall which gives you the impression that's an, likely an ectopic ureter and what we often call a pseudo ure ureterocele. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is the, uh, again, the same issue where you might end, start with a VCUG but end up in the wrong opening. Um, low for no function in the upper pole on that right side on an MRU, we'll see a dilated upper pole system uh, with a the upper pole ureter entering somewhere posterior to the bladder and distal to the bladder. Now, whether it's in the vagina or not, you often have to look at time of cystoscopy. And so for the classic uh, ectopic ureter, you have many options, of course. Uh, here's your cystoscopy, you'll see duplication on the right side, maybe. Maybe sometimes, and on the list I showed you, see an ectopic ureter somewhere in the urethra or right at the bladder neck. Again, that same question comes up, remove, reconstruct, or observe. The long time standard of care was certainly the upper pole partial nephrectomy. Um, when I was training, when many of you were training, this is what we were taught to do, uh, make excise the cap. And it was quite simple of a procedure because you already saw that side, you know, the dilated upper pole, you removed it and then you pulled up on the ureter and then put a right angle clank, clamp as distal as you could, squeezed it, cut above it. And you said, yeah, we got the ureter. But of course, one of the disadvantages is that you end up with a ureteral stump. And we've had plenty, I've gone back to remove from, Patients having had a, a, a partial nephrectomy 20 years ago, now having recurrent UTI, end up having a bigger stump than they thought that they had at the time that this was removed. And of course, you have some traction on the hilum, even open or robotic or laparoscopic, you are going to have some traction on the hilum. Now, Mohan Gundetti, who many of you know, is a very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, shared with me uh, a video that he has on the robotic. Uh, Here would, we uh, are describing the retrograde uh, technique of robotic. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off the music. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, this is a patient, a classic patient for a upper pole partial nephrectomy. Um, here he has an umbilical port, then two eight millimeter uh, ports. Uh, so he's showing us now the robotic uh, approach, which is very similar to the laparoscopic approach that I typically use for partial nephrectomy. I don't like robot as much for uh, ext extirpative surgery. I use it all the time, but more for reconstructive. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see here, you're going to reflect the bowel to expose uh, the kidney. Um, and then uh, once uh, uh, he uh, incises the line of tolt, um, you can see uh, the kidney is being exposed, Gerota's fascia is being incised. Uh, I'll just move things along. Here he's found the distal uh, ureter um, of the dilated upper pole ureter. And he's gonna use that then to go for anti-grade dissection back towards the hilum. So here's the upper pole moiety ureter. And then he will find, of course, the lower pole hilum. And this is the critical step in the procedure because you have to find uh, the uh, lower pole hilum and then go underneath that. And that is of course the most difficult part for any of us that have done upper pole partials uh, laparoscopically or robotically because you don't wanna damage that lower pole hilum and it can be done. So there it is, you can see here's the hilum to the lower pole. So he has to manage to get this underneath and sometimes you can have some adhesions there and so you have to be very careful. And I think that's where, if you look at when complications occur, that's when it occurs. So there it is, the ureter has to be brought underneath. And so you can see that um, he uh, is bringing it uh, lower down. Um, and so, uh, 
I think uh, right here, he's gonna go underneath the renal hilum and pull it across. So there it is. And this is of course the most, uh, the part where you kind of catch your breath. You wanna make sure you do this right. But you can see that if you are really rough over here, you can cause some damage to the lower pole hilum. And we'll talk about some of the statistics. And then he's taking uh, the branches uh, to the upper pole uh, of the kidney um, that is to be uh, removed. And once that's done, then it's kind of a slam dunk because you can then use your uh, hot shears uh, and uh, remove the cap of that upper pole. Um, and then uh, he will remove the distal ureter. And so now he can focus. And the good thing about robotic or laparoscopic is you can take more of the stump than I think we do when we're doing it open, right? Because in open, it's a small flank incision and you're putting your right angle in. Here, you can now watch yourself taking out as much as you can, separating it from the common sheath and then uh, excising it. So that's the, um, uh, again, thanks to Mohan for sharing that with me. Now, what are the complications and late outcomes in the transperitoneal lap heminephrectomy for duplex uh, uh, kidneys? Well, you know, here in this earlier study, it's not as big, it wasn't as many patients, a smaller cohort. Complete functional loss one year later was seen in two patients. A bigger study, uh, this is a compilation of all the heminephrectomy studies in the literature. And you can see here that even in Mohan Gundetti's earlier, when he was at Great Ormond Street study, they had almost 10% of their patients had renal loss. You can see this other study had shown almost a 9% loss. So the entire kidney being lost after a partial nephrectomy. So it's a real risk when you're pulling that ureter underneath. Now I will tell you that Mohan and ourselves, Gundetti and uh, CHOP and University of Chicago, we combined our data and compared the UU to heminephrectomy and his number of renal loss has gone down. So with more practice, he feels that he's really overcome that, uh, uh, that risk. But it's certainly a, a risk in less experienced hands because of the traction that you end up putting on the lower pole hilum. Now, if you don't do a heminephrectomy, you're gonna do what I did, uh, uh, which is uh, at earlier before I moved to other options, which is an open partial, uh, an open ureteral reimplant. Take the upper pole ureter and lower pole ureter, and there's the upper pole dilated and the lower pole ureter. You might spatch, you might uh, you know uh, uh, narrow that uh, ureter, imbricate it, uh, because it can be such a dilated ureter and then re-implant it into the bladder, make a tunnel as we're doing here. And you can see the uh, new upper pole ureter orifice and the lower pole ureter orifice. But I have now moved to a different way of doing that. And that's the uh, uh, using the uh, upper uh, to lower pole uh, ureter ureterostomy. Um, I believe that uh, you know this approach gives me the safety of saying that if I can move this ureter to this ureter, I don't have to go up here. I don't have to get into the hilum. I don't have to pass this upper pole ureter underneath the renal hilum. Uh, and uh, I can stay out of, uh, you know, mobilizing bowel. I can put my robot in uh, and we'll see some videos and go directly right at the pelvic brim, just above uh, the round ligament, just proximal to the round ligament, I will go ahead and do the ureter ureterostomy. Now, you know, uh, many of the more experienced doctors in the audience might say, well, you know, you do an upper to lower pole ureter ureterostomy, uh, you're gonna open yourself up to uh, high grade reflux, uh, you're gonna open yourself up to yo-yo reflux. What about the lower pole ureter? Here's this nice ureter doing its business, draining the lower pole. Are you gonna take this big, fat, ugly upper pole and attach it and incise it? What are your complications? We'll talk about that. Now, when was the ureter ureterostomy? It's been around for a long time. 1969 was when it was first described. Furlit adapted it for obstruction. Uh, one of my partners, who many of you might know for his hypospadias work, Mark Zayans, uh, he's one of my partners here at CHOP, senior partners. Uh, he does all of these open as taught to him in Chicago by Casimir Furlit, which is through a small uh, groin incision, like a hernia incision, taking the upper pole ureter and attaching it to the lower pole ureter. Uh, there were bigger studies. Initially, a small study it did, uh, uh, 
be, uh, this is a large cohort of ectopic ureter management. Eight of these patients they did with UU and all seemed to do well. So this was then enlarged to a larger study that George Kaplan uh, reported 41 patients with obstructed upper pole ureters and showed a very good success rate of 94%. Now laparoscopic or Ricardo Gonzalez uh, really took this and popularized it through laparoscopic ipsilateral ureter ure ureterostomy. And then Rama Jayanti uh, uh, followed that up with an even larger uh, series, I think about 45 patients of uh, ipsilateral UU and showed excellent results. And it was really after conversations with Rama that I started doing more of this uh, with uh, robotic uh, surgery. So no reported complications in Rama's study, uh, uh, length of stay was low, success rate was excellent. And so there's uh, my study uh, when we first started doing that uh, back in uh, 2012. Uh, and then uh, a follow-up study from Cincinnati looked at the same uh, uh, approach. And as usual for, you're gonna always use these words, superior visualization, 10 times mag, uh, excellent maneuverability, cosmesis, early recovery, short operative time. So how do I put in my ports? I, I typically put an umbilical port and two uh, a lateral ports. Sometimes I try to hide these ports a little lower. They'll put this port even lower to get it into the belt line and maybe one will be a visible port. I have been doing a tunneling, make incisions here and then tunnel up, but I haven't felt that that's great for you use because sometimes you need more space to work on removing, immobilizing the proximal ureter. So I tend to put this, the, the ports as I've shown. I use five millimeter ports. Now, many of you, uh, uh, Dr. Fahad and others, you know, who do a lot of robotic surgery will probably uh, say, well, that's nice, but the XI system, the new one only has eight millimeter ports. And so at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I still only have the SI. I have not allowed us to invest in the XI uh, because, excuse me, because there is no five millimeter instrumentation. And I really believe the five millimeter gives me a nice, better cosmesis than eight millimeter. That's a whole other discussion. So uh, this is, um, you know, common approach for us. You know, you, you go right in, there's the round ligament uh, right here. You can see you know, ovaries right, uh, uterus is right there. The round ligament is uh, there. Here's the dilated upper pole ureter and we stent the lower pole ureter. Uh, I leave a string on the stent so we can remove it at one week at home. Uh, but uh, what we do is we, we stent the lower pole ureter to kind of identify and protect it. Then the upper pole ureter separated from the common sheath. If you go just proximal, it's not attached to the lower pole ureter. And so it's a safe place to mobilize it, uh, incise it. It can be quite ugly and large sometimes. Uh, and then um, once it's entirely cut, uh, we're going to then uh, look at the uh, lower pole ureter. And as I mentioned, now uh, here, I think I had uh, placed a uh, hit stitch uh, I don't always use a hit stitch, uh, you know, if the ureter is quite visible. In fact, I just did one last week and I did not use a hit stitch. Um, but, you know, here uh, we'll work on separating it. You have to be a little bit careful there. Don't go too far and damage the lower pole ureter. But, uh, you know, take it as far as we can right up to the bladder uh, and then uh, let it go. So there is a stump, of course, but a minor stump compared to other ways of doing it, I hope. And so... You know, once that upper pole is uh, mobilized uh, completely, um, you know, uh, here a hitch is being placed just to stabilize the lower pole ureter. I try not to mobilize it too much, try not to get into its mesentery too much. Uh, this is an older video, <laughs> as, as we always say, but here I am uh, make, uh, making an incision in the uh, recipient don't, uh, ureter. Um, you can see the stent is in place. Uh, and then uh, quite simple, you can see right there, you just have to connect uh, these two uh, things. Um, I don't use any heat with the scissors, so I just use a five, mil five millimeter scissor without the heat and then uh, begin the, the suturing. And then, uh, you know, I sometimes will stitch up a bit a proximal to distal. Here we're stitching distal uh, to proximal. So it just all depends on what the anatomy gives itself to. Um, and then uh, you can see that, you know, we will begin um, uh, connecting this. Uh, and then it's simply a uh, end to side uh, anastomosis. It goes very smoothly. 
And what you can see here is that, okay, you enter and it's right there. The ureter is sometimes as large as bowel, right? You don't have to mobilize any bowel. I have the patient is in significant lithotomy position. So all the bowel is falling away, just like for a re-implant. So I can see everything very clearly. I haven't incised the line of tolt. I haven't incised durotas. I haven't mobilized the kidney at all. Uh, distally, all we did is we did a cysto retrograde beforehand uh, and, and placed the stent. And so it, this is an about uh, a 90 minute procedure. Uh, you're done, uh, finished, um, and you leave it. Uh, and we've had, uh, we'll talk about the results. Uh, this is another video on an older girl uh, that I did. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, was one of the ones that we reported in, uh, in that paper I shared with you earlier. So again, there's the uh, round ligament. Uh, we're just incising, uh, mobilizing the upper pole ureter. Um, cutting it, just showing. In this case, it's an older girl. I think she was about uh, 14, 15 years old, who was having UTIs and, and incontinence uh, and had not been diagnosed. So this still happens um, uh, to have an ectopic ureter. Finally had a full workup. And there we can see that the lower pole ureter has been uh, you know, uh, stented. And because in an older girl, things are very deep, there's a lot of mesenchyme and tissue uh, I did put a hit stitch to kind of bring the ureter up so we can, uh, you know, see it a little better. Um, and uh, this, uh, in this case, I think I was using um, uh, of eight millimeter instrumentation because she was older. Uh, and there it is. Uh, and then uh, making the uh, incision uh, into the ureter. Uh, you can see the stent uh, very clearly, visible there. Um, and then here you can see I'm doing distal, to, uh, proximal to distal anastomosis. So it just depends what, uh, what gives itself uh, to us. And then you can just see, go up one side, leave the suture long, start from the other side, come down and stitch to it. Very, very simple procedure uh, with excellent, um, uh, it's not technically challenging at all, much easier than a pyloplasty or many of the other procedures that we do uh, more routinely. So we reported our experience with this, the ipsilateral UU, this function of the obstructed moiety matter, because many of you are gonna say, well, if there's no function in the upper pole, what should we do? Should we just remove it? Or should we tie off the ureter? Should we uh, do a UU? Uh, and what if you do a UU and there's no, uh, uh, you know, no function of that upper pole? Well, we did 62 uh, IUU cases. Uh, uh, of them, 43 were robotic, 19 were open. And in 33 pa uh, 23 patients, there was less than 10% function, almost no function in the upper pole. And there's the median follow-up on all of our patients. Uh, antenatal hydra was the reason that they were referred to us, then UTI, the UU at the pelvic brim, ureteral stent uh, for one month in this earlier study. And some of them had a ureteroseal. And if they had a ureteroseal, we simply incised it at the time. And you can see uh, 11 of our patients had a ureteroseal uh, and they, we just did an IUU for those patients. And postoperatively, we had complete resolution in most of our patients. Uh, the hydro ureter was gone in almost all of the patients uh, and the complications were low. Uh, if you look at uh, a larger uh, series, these are all the studies that I could find on ureter or ureterostomy, including our earlier studies. And you can see overall the success rate has been quite good. Uh, Mark Zayons, my senior partner, will often say, you know, I've had patients with yo-yo reflux, or he saw two patients who came to him late in life with obstruction of the UU. With, and he felt that if you do this too high, uh, you know, if you do it too low and there is an obstruction, you can have a uh, obstruction of the, of the lower pole ureter. I haven't seen that. Uh, we're continuing to watch that, but so far we're pretty happy with, with what we've seen. So the duplex system overall is a complex management challenge. The options range from observation to incision uh, to lower track reconstruction that we talked about. Observation is most appropriate in what we have found in two studies that I've shown you for single systems with duplex systems with minimal dilation and if they have normal voiding function. Ureteral ureterostomy for upper tract obstruction in a duplex system gets us to the goal of a reliable single intervention treatment option with excellent safety profile. 
And sometimes, you know, if I have a patient with a ureteral seal um, who uh, I can get to about six months, seems to be a, 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 even an ectopic ureteral seal, uh, but not severe dilation of the upper pole that requires an immediate incision. I have, we have done now for some of our patients, as we discussed, a UU and then incise at the same time. And that's a single stage procedure because now you don't have reflux. You don't have to come back for a re-implant. Uh, and you just have a little stump and you just obstruct it. You incise the ureter seal so the bladder neck gets better. Doug Canning, some of my senior partners will say, well, you know, you should really, Howard Snyder would always talk about the keeling bladder neck repair, up to re reconstruction in, in ureter seals. When you remove the ureter seal, you have this defect. I watch that. If the patient has a stable muscle and just has a ureter seal, I have gone ahead and just incised and done a UU and those patients have done well. I have to wait for five year, 10 year follow-up, but I do think that we're getting closer to a single stage approach. And so just on behalf of the AUA, many of you know that the date for the Las Vegas meeting has been changed to September 10th through 13th. It's not in May. Uh, we're all adjusting to our new reality. Um, I'm hopeful that by, and I'm very, very optimistic that by September, we're gonna be living in a different world, I hope, in terms of COVID and that all of you, our friends in uh, Saudi Arabia and around the world that are watching uh, will join us there. So I wanna thank you again, uh, uh, all of you for uh, inviting me uh, to join you uh, for this uh, meeting. So I will uh, stop uh, screen sharing. And uh, open to questions, discussion. Um, thank you, Prof. Shukla, for your uh, elegant presentation. It was uh, very fruitful, and uh, I hope uh, a lot of people has gained a lot of information from that uh, presentation. Uh, and by the way, um, Mark uh, Zowens is attending our uh, webinar, so he's one of the ah. audience participants. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope he. I hope he mentions me as much as I mention him. Tell him. <laughs> so, uh, welcome, Mark, uh, to our uh, webinar, and I hope to uh, uh, participate. Uh, I hope. Uh, I mean, we, we will send an invitation for him to participate also with us. We'll be more than welcome to have him in our uh, webinar. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Would you start with the questions, please? Uh, anyone who has a question, please uh, post it in the Q uh, and A uh, question in the uh, top, bottom of the screen, and we we'll try to answer uh, uh, most of the questions. So Absolutely, yeah. Dr. Shukla. Again, I uh, I echo Mustafa here. Thank you so much. This was a really informative, elegant, elegant presentation. Uh, there is a uh, questions. Uh, Few, few of them here. Let me start with this one. I see Mark so, Zayans has already posted uh, that they were not obstructed. The anastomosis is wide open. They had yo-yo reflex. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. This what, Mark is here what, to correct. <laughs> this is what he just said. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. So there was thank a question about about uh, when when you come to the to the uh, uretric uretric um, uh, dissection and if, if those. Two ureters, the upper and lower polyureters, were very adherent, which sometimes happens. So, what's 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 the step here? Or what's the management here? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I would say that they can be adherent. Uh, that's why I go more proximal. If it's completely adherent distally, as you get more proximal, they start separating, and so you can find a avascular plane. I shouldn't okay. say avascular, but you can begin the dissection more carefully if you go more proximal. If it's severe, you have to go right up to the kidney. You can do a UU at the proximal ureter level. Okay, perfect. And uh, one of the questions here, I think uh, you mentioned that toward the end of your of your of your video that for the retro seal uh, and if you basically can you just do a UU rather than touching the retro seal? But I think you mentioned that you can do both at the same time, uh, where you basically do a uh, do a UU and then you go ahead and incise the retro seal. So yeah, uh, well, just I, to elaborate on that. Yes, I, he's right. Uh, Dr. Alam is uh, very right that you can just leave it alone. Um, I tend to incise it if it's a larger ureter seal, so it looks like it could sort of end up, uh, you know, uh, obstructing or even if it de deflates slowly. 
I would rather I'm there in a younger baby, just give it an incision and it completely decompresses quickly. Uh, but he's right that if you uh, do a, um, uh, if you do the IUU, um, it eventually will deflate on its own. All right, okay. And this is a question from uh, our, our uh, respected colleague, Dr. al Utey here in, here in Saudi Arabia. And he's asking about the fate of the reflux post urethral seal incision. Of course, he's, he's, he's saying that the debate is still big about this. So what are the, or what is the recommendation from your experience about, you know, post urethral incision um, uh, reflux? Yeah, so um, post urethral uh, reflux is challenging, right? So if you have a boy, and in Saudi, like the United States, many will be circumcised. So, uh, you know, 80 per 70 percent in the U.S. are circumcised. Uh, boys uh, will be, uh, you know, higher there. But uh, if you have a boy, you incise your reader seal, and he has reflux into the upper pole. Yeah, you can watch it. You know, maybe if they have no okay. UTIs at around age two, age 18 months, two years, stop the antibiotics, and we might just see, and they'll do fine. Uh, a girl with high-grade reflux uh, into the upper pole after an incision, um, I tend to want to do something, either an IUU or a reimplant, depending on the stability of the bladder neck. If I think I have to do bladder neck reconstruction, as I was saying, if there's some defect in the bladder neck, when the child voids, you see some ballooning, you might see eversion of the, of the floor of the bladder then I'm going to consider doing an open procedure. Uh, you can do it robotically, but you have to get so posterior that I think it's difficult uh, in robotic surgery. So I'll do an open, uh, uh, you know, uh, fan and steel and, and do a traditional repair, uh, like Howard Snyder taught me doing a keeling bladder neck, you know, bringing the necks of fibers together to strengthen the floor. Okay. But he's right. Uh, it, it's not a easy answer when to do a re-implant, but you want to treat them symptomatically. Okay. Mustafa, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, one question from an uh, anonymous attendee. So <laughs> he, he didn't mention <laughs> anonymous attendee anyway. Uh -huh. so welcome. Yeah. Uh, if the lower bowl moiety is non-functioning, uh, then will uh, the UU uh, will be an option or would you go for yeah. partial effectively? That's a good question. You know, we have done um, several lower to upper pole UU in patients who have high grade reflux into the lower pole, but no reflux in the upper pole. Then we have done a UU. Uh, if the patient has no function in the lower pole from a UPJ, I tend to do a, a lower pole nephrectomy. Uh, if they have no function uh, because of reflux dysplasia, um, you can consider doing a UU um, or removing. You know, if he, uh, as many of you know, doing a partial nephrectomy for lower pole is very simple because you don't have the hilum to deal with. You don't have to go underneath the hilum. You can just go pop, pop, pop and, and be done robotically, even with the ligature. I don't want to make it sound simple, but if it's a very blown out system, it can be a rather simple procedure. So it depends on the, on the circumstance, but uh, you know, uh, um, I have done lower pole more likely doing a partial nef lower pole nephrectomy if it's a blown out, poorly functioning system. Okay, okay. thank you, Dr. Shukla. Dr. Shukla, there is a question from our colleague, uh, Dr. al Gurney from King Faisal Specialist Hospital, again here in Riyadh. And he's asking, first of all, he's thanking you for the presentation. And he's asking if uh, about, about the urethral clipping in the non functioning moiety, it's either the ectopic or the, the urethral So. What's your, what's your input in that and experience? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, so this uh, technique of, uh, of clipping the ureter for a poorly functioning kidney sort of started, uh, I think at Mayo Clinic, uh, they had some series in transplant patients, patients going for transplant who had proteinuria, a high uh, level of proteinuria. Instead of doing a nephrectomy, they clipped the ureter. Kidney got hydronephrotic, but it was already poorly functioning and then stopped working. Uh, and they found that they didn't have to go in and do nephrectomies on these patients. And then, uh, at least from what I know, uh, Armando uh, and uh, sick kids uh, and Fahad and others are trained there, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, popularized this and have had very good results. Uh, I don't know Armando's long-term follow-up, and maybe some of you do. Um, you know, how are these patients really doing? I think I have done it twice, um, and those patients actually did very well. 
uh, when uh, they had actually no dilation of the upper pole ureter, it was stenotic upper pole ureter, um, you can't do a UU because you have, uh, you know, it's poorly functioning and the ureter is narrow. So what's the point here of doing anything maybe, but the ureter is ectopic. So I just tied it off and I left it. Uh, and those, that patient has done very well. I see her for long-term, I think I'm about six, seven years out, no change in the upper pole has just disappeared. So I think it's a doable thing, but I hesitate to do it when you have a dilated system already to make it worse by tying it off. Uh, I think the long-term, we don't know when you have a prominent upper pole. And so I tend to just do a UU if you have an upper pole, dilated upper pole ureter and a dilated upper pole, better to do a UU. And now with 40s, you know, we have over 60 patients we've done UU since I've been at CHOP for the last nine years, I'm gonna do that. Awesome. Mustafa. Okay, sure. Um, I think one also, uh, sometimes you see uh, an uh, ectopic uh, uh, reflexing ureter. So uh, I think um, ureteral clipping in those cases might be risky at, uh, as they might harbor some organisms. And so uh, with the reflux. So yeah. probably a purely ectopic ureter uh, clipping might work, but if there is associated uh, reflux, especially in ectopic uh, um, I mean, ureters at the bladder neck or ectopic ureterosil might be uh, problematic. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the next question is, is about um, the presence of contralateral reflux at the same time when you do your uh, reconstruction. Would you correct it at the same time or you will uh, postpone it to another session or? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I do it, uh, it, it depends. So, you know, sometimes I'm doing a UU for ectopic ureter in a six month old. They have grade three reflux on the other side. I'm not going to fix it. I tell the family, look, six months old, 70 to 80% chance that this reflux will resolve by 18 months of age. Uh, I don't think I should go operate on the other side right now when the child has never had a problem a UTI from that side, for example. So let me do the UU right now. If it's necessary, we'll return to do a reimplant on the other side, but I'm not gonna do a reimplant and mess with the ureter. That's minding its own business and likely going to improve. If you have grade five reflux, now those kids I try to keep on antibiotic prophylaxis and not repair the ectopic ureter, maybe to about 18 months, two years. Let me see if I can get away with it. Now, you know, uh, then decide if I have to do it, then I'll repair both at the same time. So on those children, I will repair the contralateral extra vesicle ureteral reimplant yeah, using, uh, you know, the technique that I've written about, and then do a UU on the other side. So, you know, if I'm going in early, I'm not going to correct it. But if I'm going in because of symptomatic, they've had UTIs and pilo, then yes, I will do the reimplant. Again, a very good question, <laughs> making me think. <laughs> See, this is why it's so variable to do a talk. It's uh, uh, very intimidating on up uh, duplex uh, anomalies because they're all over the place. And you guys are asking the perfect questions. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the perfect answer, actually, uh, Prof. Dr. Uh, Dr. Abu Zaid is another good, respected colleague's, uh, colleague, actually, of, uh, of ours here in Saudi Arabia in the, in the uh, in the southern region, and he's asking about probably you 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 uh, elaborated on that a little bit about the timing of surgery, Prof. Shukla, and is toilet uh -huh. training make any 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 kind of you know decision uh, changing in in terms of chances for success? Um, so um, toilet training uh, can uh, affect things. So. I, you know, as you know, many of you know, who deal with uh, urine reflux, uh, we tend to try to put off urine reflux uh, in surgery. Either I want to do it before toilet training or after toilet training, but the period of toilet training is a high risk time. You have more bowel and bladder dysfunction. They're learning to relax, to, uh, to tighten, to relax. They're sometimes overly tuned in after you do the surgery. They don't want to pee because it burns, it hurts. They have spasms. And so it's really a bad time to do bladder surgery at the period of toilet training. So I tend to think about, okay, what is my risk stratification that this child will need surgery at when I find it at three months? Then I say, okay, let me do it at nine months of age, a year of age, six months of age. 
or if I can wait, then wait till the toilet train and then we'll deal with the uh, surgery. But right in that peri, you know, toilet training area, I like to stay out of the bladder as much as I can. Sometimes you have no choice. You're having repeated febrile UTIs. Uh, you know, you have other issues, families traveling, they're here, they came, you know, blah, blah, blah. You might have to do it. Um, but as far as I can, I try to wait. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so uh, the next question from uh, my colleague, uh, our colleague Ahmed Zahrani. Uh, uh, um, his question is, uh, will you manage, uh, sorry, how will you manage the uh, averting urethrocele? Probably means the prolapsing urethrocele. Would you manage it uh, differently or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so an averting urethrocele, I still treat it initially like a regular urethrocele. Okay, so I'm still going to say, okay, I have a three month old, let's say three month old with an everting ureter seal, duplex system, dilated upper pole ureter, same criteria for incision, which is dilated, uh, you know, a high grade obstruction, uh, a, a big upper pole, UTI, um, uh, and ectopic ureter seal. I'm gonna say this child is a higher risk for problems. So I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna incise. It. I know that if it's an everting ureter seal, there's a chance I'm gonna to have to return for a bladder neck reconstruction. I tell the family that, that this might not be. But what I find is some of those infants with, with everting ureter seal, by two years of age, that floor matures and sometimes the diversion gets less. Um, so, uh, but as I mentioned, very good question, that if I have to go now to do a repair, I'm less likely to do a robotic repair if they have eversion of the ureter seal, a significant eversion, because then I'm gonna do a keeling bladder neck repair and then re-implant the ureters or do, uh, I tend to do an intravesical procedure, intra-extravesical, rather than just do a robotic IUU for those patients. Okay, awesome. And uh, so this is a uh, question slash, slash comment from your colleague again, Dr. Ziont. Okay. So he's saying, uh, and this is, I'm quote unquote, Asim, can you comment on the issue of up to 10% error on the renal scans when assessing post upper pole nephrectomy? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, yes, there can be an error um, and uh, upper pole, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it just depends that if you do an upper pole nephrectomy and you do a renal scan, as I showed you some data that, that you might have a loss of function. Is it within the 10% loss? Well, I mean, we can argue that the patient had 30% function, now has 20% function. I mean, I think that's a, that could be potentially significant, but, um, you know, the, the, the data that I showed you of Mohan studies, uh, there was actually, or the one before that, it was complete loss of renal function. Uh, in up to, in two patients out of, uh, I think it was out of 30. So a little less than 10%, but still a, a risk of losing the kidney over, um, you know, a procedure that I think you can have zero with. So, and if, if Mark is talking about upper pole function, um, then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we just don't care about the upper, I don't even get renal scan oftentimes when I have an upper pole obstruction. I see massive hydro inside the ureter seal, then go back at six months or a year and do a UU. If there isn't massive, just moderate upper pole hydro, kid is going, doing well, antibiotic prophylaxis around six months of age, UU, done inside the ureter seal or not inside the ureter seal, depends. Um, but I don't, an ectopic ureter, no function upper pole, no problem. It doesn't change my management. You know now when I say ectopic ureter, most of the time, you, you. Because what I have found is that what's, what am I trying to do? I want to prevent this child from having incontinence and UTI. So what I have to do is get that ectopic ureter out of the way. And whether I plug it into the lower pole ureter or plug it into the bladder, I have to do something to get the bladder out of the way. It doesn't matter how much function you have. I'm not trying to save function by doing this procedure because most ectopic ureters have minimal function in the upper pole. And so that's how I think about it, that look, I just need to get that upper pole ureter out of the way. And I have found that connecting it to the lower pole ureter is safe, reproducible. I feel very good about it. And we have a lot of patients now to say that that is the truth. 
as much as you can say truth, but it's my experience. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we have a couple of questions regarding uh, nuclear scan, actually. The, 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 um, whether would you prefer DMSA or MAG3 to assist for a portable function? Mm -hmm. And um, would you do the renal isotope scan? And would you consider uh, a function of 8% that is candidate for partial nephrectomy? Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, okay. good questions again. Now, you know, if I'm looking uh, at an upper pole, um, and, you know, there's a question of, okay, um, you know, is it obstruction? Is it, what's the function? And is there obstruction? I think I'm going to get a MAG3 because I'm going to get that cortical, uh, um, you know, uh, imaging, and I'm going to kind of know the renal function. If it really matters, but remember what I just said, I don't even do renal scan most of the time now. If I think I know it's an ectopic ureter, I mean, I might as a baseline, but it's really not going to change my management. So I just want to document that we had minimal function or we have functions. So um, I don't think I, it matters too much whether you get a DMSA or a MAG3. You know, take your pick. Um, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I tend to get a MAG3 because I can then rule out, I not rule out, but I get the transit time. I can make sure everything, you know, sometimes you might have some hydro on the other side. Get a MAG3, everything is cleared up. Um, and then uh, 8%, you, you. Um, I don't do partial nephrectomy. I haven't done a partial nephrectomy for duplex anomaly, upper pole partial, in at least nine years. Um, I have done, uh, you know, lower pole partial nephrectomies many times for a blown out UPJ, um, but I have not done um, an upper pole partial in a long time for a topic ureter or ureter seal. Awesome, Dr. Shukla. And uh, this is a uh, this is probably our last question. Oh well, um, a, a question from Dr. Almatami is is our, our colleague in King Faisal Specialist Hospital and saying, after incising the retro seal, with a VUR resulting from that, uh, is deflux injection uh, an option uh, before you reimplant or not? Uh, well, anything. I guess it's an option. Um, you know, I, I'll say that. Um, do I do it? No. Um, if you look at even the best data, say Andy Kirsch's data and, you know, others who do a lot of uh, um, uh, deflux, they don't have very good numbers in a ureter seal incision in the upper pole, right? They don't like duplex system overall. You don't get as good results. And then you have an incised ureter seal. So you have a really weak floor here. Um, and, uh, you know, everything tells me that you're not going to, or you have a higher risk of obstruction because that upper pole doesn't function very well. So if you ask me, that's not the way I'm going to go. Um, and it probably is a contraindication. So I'll tell you this, I don't do deflux. Um, you know, when I have low grade reflux, I don't want to fix it. Hopefully we can stop antibiotics. If they're having UTI, so it's real reflux, like I, this is a reflux we have to fix. I'm going to fix it with a re-implant. I mean, I tell the family that, you know, this is uh, patients going under anesthesia. Um, I think this gives me the highest chance of success. Okay, I think uh, we, we, um, we it's time for uh, give time for cases. So mm -hmm. um, I mean, cases always uh, interesting and also give more information because it 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 reflects the real life. Yeah. So um, we have collected a uh, few cases for discussion uh -huh. and hopefully in each uh, case, we want to deliver uh, a message. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, Yasser, would you please uh, start sharing your screen? Absolutely. Uh, Just one second. So we have like um, half an hour to finish our uh, time. We will see how much cases we can go through, uh, mm -hmm. how many cases. So. And we would uh, hopefully uh, uh, finish by 10.30 Saudi time, uh, 3.30 uh, EST. Yeah, it's getting late for you guys. <laughs> no, uh, for us, it's still 10.30 uh, is acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> On a Saturday night, right? <laughs> yeah. We, Sunday's we a work day, though, right? Sunday, Sunday work. we are working here tomorrow. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. 
Just one second, because... Shall I share it from my side now? If you can, Mustafa, I would be, I would be thankful. It's a, uh, it's a little bit... Uh, do you see it now? Mm -hmm. Yes, see it. Okay. Mustafa, is that yours or mine? I'm not sure, honestly. This is, uh, no, this is mine, I think. Okay, okay. So, I'll, Mustafa, I'm, I'm just going to ask you kindly just to uh, okay. go to the next one after. So, yes, please. Thank you very much. So, so Dr. Shukla, basically, this is a six-month-old baby boy. And he's a uh, postnatal referral because of a right antenatal hydronephrosis. This boy was, uh, you know, uh, it was an uneventful pregnancy with a, with, a, with a normal spontaneous delivery. And immediately post post delivery, he was started on, on antibiotics and prophylactic antibiotics. Next. So these are the, the uh, out, uh, sorry, the uh, renal ultrasound that was, that was obtained. And uh, as you can see, uh, there, is, there is a mild dilatation of uh, the upper, uh, which is a right, right duplication with an upper moiety dilatation. And uh, you can see the proximal ureter is dilated on the second part, uh, moving down to the uh, bladder actually, where you can see that the ureter, ureter actually uh, is dilated. Uh, his, his left kidney uh, is, is, is normal. Mm -hmm. Next. So uh, VCG was obtained and uh, as you can see, uh, you know, your, uh, bladder looks normal, no ureteroceals, uh, no reflux, uh, and, and he's, 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 he's boiling normally. Next. And of course now he's off cap and he's, he's asymptomatic, uh, I mean, Specifically, that and there's no no UTI or febrile episode that might suggest UTI. And I want to follow up. Uh, this was this was this was the, the the finding. As you can see, that now we have a in, increasing dilatation of the upper formality on the on the right kidney with the still normal left side. The distal part uh, of the ureter is, is is probably more dilated compared to the to the to the previous study when he was when he was younger. Mm -hmm. Next. So uh, right side global global function of a 35 percent, probably uh, the, the upper moiety has, has, has no function. Next. Now this is his last follow-up. Uh, six months after what, what, what you've seen previously, again, he's still asymptomatic. There's no febrile and there's no UTI. Uh, more probably dilatation of the, of the of a non-functioning upper pole moiety, almost, you know, lost cortex uh, tissue. Uh, this part more or less remains, remains stable. It's not, it's not that dilated. Uh, left kidney is normal, boy is asymptomatic. Next. Yeah. Now, so, so this is a six month, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, sorry, six month uh, duplex asymptomatic ectopic ureter draining in unfunctioning right upper moiety. So your opinion, uh, Prof Shukla. So it's a beautiful case, right? Because you have a six-month-old uh, with antenatal hydro. Otherwise, you'd have no reason for diagnosing this. Um, and it seemed to be mild, seemed to get better, but now slowly. And then if you look at those ultrasounds again, if you just go back to one of the bladder images, you see the classic look of a, of an, of a pseudo ureteroceal, right? You see a distal ureter that sometimes it's a thick walled urethra seal or is lifting up the floor of the bladder. So you very uh, rightly said, Dr. Yasser, that this is uh, likely an ectopic ureter. Um, now, if you have the facility, and we don't everywhere in the world, I know that, for an MRU, um, you get beautiful images and you might be able to trace where this upper pole ureter is headed. Because the one thing that we know that if it is an ectopic ureter in a boy, Either it's ending up in the proximal urethra, which is okay, maybe it's fine. You know, that might not cause a big problem for him. It doesn't cause incontinence in males, as we know, because of the embryology. Um, or it could end up in one of the uh, Wolfian structures, right? Seminal vesicle, yes, vas vesicles, mm -hmm. epididymis, which is bad, which might show up later with a problem. And you might have a burned out testicle, which is sometimes how we find it. A child comes with multiple epididymorchitis, a testicle is small, like a, like a walnut, hard and like a rock. Testicle is gone because of this, you know, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. So I would consider doing the MRU. If not, 
Okay, if you, you can also do a CT scan, but that's a large, uh, you know, load of radiation to get, you know, uh, delayed images of seeing the ureters. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this is a perfect case for a UU <laughs> because, you know, you can put in a stent in the lower pole, you can scope him, and at that time, find out where everything is going, do a UU, um, and you know that you're not going to have an issue. If this ureter is in a bad place, you're not going to get a problem. If it's uh, in the proximal urethra, you can scope. And if it's proximal urethra, it's near the bladder neck, you can leave it alone. But because there's dilation, you might end up with pain later or a UTI later. I would just do the UU. I can't give you good statistics in a circumcised boy. What's the chance he's going to have a UTI? What's the chance? I don't know. I'm going to say maybe 2%. What's the chance he gets hypertension from a blown out upper pole? It has not been shown. We have actually looked at, at some of the retrospective studies, uh, meta-analysis, exceedingly low risk of getting UTI. And malignancy, no, zero. So, you know, uh, I would do a UU, but if you told me I'm going to watch him right now and see if he has symptoms, I don't think you're a bad doctor. I mean, I think that's a reasonable choice if the parents say, okay, okay, okay. He's got no problems. What are you talking about surgery? You can watch him for a while. Perfect. Thank what you did so you choose? Much. What did you decide? Uh, nothing decided yet. I mean, waiting for this, but uh, probably right. the UU and the uh, and the and the and the incision. Yeah. 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 Well, what sorry, you the UU. Well, this is not the. This is yeah. not the. This is not the urethroscene. I'm sorry. There's another one in my mind. Urethroscene. Right. So basically, the UU for this guy. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think. I think. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think uh, we have done uh, something uh, apart from hemiflectomy. I think yeah, I'm not that's, sure. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. Good okay. case. Okay, so we'll move to the next uh, case. Uh, this is a two years old boy who presented uh, with recurrent febrile UTIs. Uh, he was found to have a right doublet system with lower moiety VR. Um, he was treated somewhere else, and there went a failed trial of endoscopic correction for the VUR, and then he was referred to us. So this is his uh, initial assessment at the age of two years when he presented to us, showing uh, a right doublet system with a severely dilated lower moiety and uh, with a severe hydroureteral process down to the bladder with a normal left kidney. This is his voiding sister retrogram showing uh, uh, a very uh, huge uh, right uh, lower moiety uh, VUR with dropping lily appearance and the normal bladder and urethra. This is his DMSA scan uh, showing uh, a normal functioning uh, left kidney with uh, reduced function on the, uh, on the right, about 18%. Uh, the global renal function is about, of the right kidney is 18%, but when we look at uh, split function of the right kidney itself. So the, the lower bowl accounts for, the, it was measured as 60% versus 40% of mm. the upper bowl. Mm. Uh, so uh, in summary, he still, uh, he was kept on cap, but he had a history of recurrent febrile UTIs with this findings, with a reduced global function of, uh, of the right of 18%. So mm -hmm. what are, the options mm -hmm. um, is, is like a, a, a complete nephrectomy is a valid option or you would go for a, a left um, lower pool partial nephrectomy or a, a, a common G3 implant. Yeah, good question. <laughs> That's a good case. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if we look at that, I was hoping that it would show me a strong upper pole uh, function and poor dysplastic lower pole function then or no function if we go back to that renal scan you know if you kind of look at it um it doesn't look like it's just the upper pole you're right i think the lower pole also is lighting up um and uh and so that makes it harder because it was just a good upper pole poor lower pole uh and uh hydro ureter say 10 percent lower pole 20 percent, even that i would take it out take out, do a lower pole uh, a nephro ureterectomy. In this situation, it's the whole kidney. Um, and you have about 18%. It's functional. Um, it's dysplastic appearing. This kind of kidney, 
you could end up with, with uh, hypertension. We all have seen patients with a dysplastic kidney having high blood pressure. However, in this situation with that reflux, I would still consider renal preservation. I would say that, okay, you know, there's function there and I believe the 18%. Sometimes you look at it like, ah, that's not 18%. I mean, it, uh, it's over reading, you're seeing spleen, you're seeing background. I believe 18% and I'm going to say I would choose to do a common sheath ureteral reimplant here. I think it's a boy if I do a good reimplant uh, and I would do it extravesically. Um, I think I can deliver a reasonably good result, even though it's high grade. You have to make a nice tunnel and you have the risk of obstruction. You have to tell the family that because you have to make a longer tunnel when you have a, a, so much reflux and that could put pressure on a, on a small kidney. It may not be able to push enough to go through that uh, 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 long tunnel. It's a risk. I would explain everything to the family, but in the end, I tend to lean towards renal preservation. If you told me which way do you lean, I have re-implanted 5% kidneys. Um, uh, because we have done a study that's in press right now looking at poorly functioning UPJs. And what we found is in even poorly functioning uh, pyloplasty, when we did them, uh, the risk of complication was low. Uh, and we saw that about 15% of those patients actually improved renal function over long term. So I give them a chance and I'm going to do a reimplant. But it's not necessarily the right answer but there's enough function there that I will do a reimplant. So uh, uh, we did for him actually a, a right ewer pool uh, partial nephrian nephrectomy. Ah, okay, good. And did, how much was it? Did, was the kidney okay, okay afterwards? So this is the post of full up. This is the remaining uh, upper pool kidney. Beautiful. It, it opened problem. up. It widened out from a little cap into a nice kidney. Yeah, yeah. and okay. uh, actually uh, this is the DMSA of the most of the MSA. Um, yeah. So do, do you really, um, I mean, what is your follow-up protocol after hemonephrectomy? Do you, you do just do routine ultrasound with yes. Doppler or something, or you do uh, still a nuclear scan? I do, yeah, I mean, you did the right thing, um, but uh, I tend to follow them with an ultrasound. Um, if I'm worried about the growth of the kidney, then I'll get a DMSA, but I don't routinely get a DMSA after a partial. Um, you know, I, I opted for a reimplant because I thought the entire kidney was weak. Um, and, and maybe, you know, I misread the, the first, but it was compressing it, you know, that poorly functioning lower pole. Oh, so yeah. I have to say that you, you made the right choice here. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it, it, the percent looks good. That's a nice result. Uh -huh. I like doing lower pole partials. Yeah, actually, the, the question, I mean, of, of free implant was there. But uh, because of the huge ureter and that would require tapering and, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes this calls for a complication. So, uh, yeah, we decided Absolutely. to go ahead with a, with a hemineffectomy. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we have time for the third case. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, Professor, this is, this is a four years old girl who is uh, basically a presentation with a recurrent febrile UTIs. And a past history of almost negative uh, renal issues, if you may. So on a follow, on a, on a, an investigation, she was fired to have left moderate hydronephrosis. Pictures are here. And uh, basically it's, uh, you can see that she has a right, right, right kidney, which is, which is normal with a, with a probably an SFU2 pushing three um, hydronephrosis, ureter can be seen actually uh, proximally and moving distally again, the ureter, the ureter can be seen dilated over there with, of course, a, a urethroseal uh, in the picture. Next, Mustafa. So uh, here's, here's, the, um, here's the VCUG, which basically shows the filling defect representing the uh, urethroseal. Uh, there is what looks like a uh, reflux of an ectopic uh, of an ectopic uh, uh, ureter. Next, Mustafa. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, was that a? Uh, it was a duplex system or a single system when you showed me? Uh, the yeah. Yeah. I th yeah, no, uh, th that that was that was. I mean, that was the debate uh, initially. I mean, ah, is okay. it a single system 
okay. single yeah. system uh, erythrocyte versus a duplication. But looking at the VCUG, most yeah. likely this is an ectopic ureter attaching to the bladder neck. And okay, uh, yeah. of course, we'll go back to the DMSA scan, Mustafa, please. So the scan actually shows in initially that there is some 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 you know, remaining function in that uh, in that kidney. Uh, if uh, my eyesight is not that bad, it's around forty percent over the thirty-nine forty percent. Okay. Now speaking of, you went, remember if previous case you said uh, if we have the facility. So we did actually. So mm -hmm. this is this is uh, this is this is Harry Mario, and uh, on nice. on the one like the uh, corner corner right there, uh, probably you see a small uh, corner right. Actually, both both uh, both both cuts shows that there is an upper upper moiety which has a little bit of a uh, of a function. Okay, nice. next most probably. So. Basically, a cystoscopy was done, and uh, there was an uh, ectopic ureter seal at the bladder neck. Uh, it was partially open. And this was uh, catheterized, and we can actually uh, entertain a, a small, a small opening there. Next, please. Yeah. And uh, uh, now, on, on, on follow-up, uh, this girl was basically having these sweating episodes. Of course, she's four years old now. She's she's post toilet training. And we're having we're having that that waiting uh, episodes uh, day and night. Mm -hmm. Now another follow up was done, and uh, an ultrasound was done, and as you can see, more or less is showing is showing the same finding with a with a you know still dilated left kidney, a dilated distal uh, ureter, and the ureterocele is is still there. Mm -hmm. Next, do we have now, a BPG? I'm uh, uh, oh, sorry, keep you're going. Uh, yeah, keep going. Sorry, uh, no. Uh, she missed. She missed her follow up, and uh, you know she went. She went for for probably a couple of years uh, away, and then she came back, and now she is totally incontinent, and, and there is no history of UTIs. Again, the ultrasound was 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 more or less showing the the, the same finding as as we previously uh, seen. That's, that's the VCG again, Prof Shukla. And this is the new one after she lost uh, uh, her follow-up. Again, uh, there, is, there, is, there is a reflux there and you can see it's going to uh, what, of course the, what to me, it looks like the, 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 the upper pole, uh, upper pole moiety. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the, the function is less uh, compared to previous and it's, it's around, around the, the 14 global, global function of about 14%. Mm -hmm. Now we have this eight years old girl uh, who's basically totally incontinent uh, with the left, left duplication, no UTIs. And we have a refluxing non-functioning upper pole moiety ureter. So what's, what's next for this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because when you did that first procedure where it was unroofed, was that the ureter seal unroofed or was it an ectopic ureter kind of being unroofed? Because um, did they incise I, the ureter seal at that time? I, 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 I leave that to Mustafa because this, is, this yeah. was stolen from him actually, Mustafa. <laughs> actually there was, uh, yeah, it was, there was like a, a cavity which uh -huh. was partially open. Okay. Uh, okay. It could be a pseudo urethral seal. I don't know, but yeah. it's sometimes difficult to puncture a pseudo urethral seal because of it is uh, uh, because of its thick yeah, so Mustafa, it's very interesting because one of my senior partners uh, was doing this for a while for ectopic ureters. Uh, if it was near the bladder neck, getting a, 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 a angled bug bee and then unroofing it up towards the trigone, making just like right in that uh, ectopic ureter. Yeah. catching it and then making an incision straight up to the trigone. Um, and uh, he felt that that could temporize the upper pole situation. Some got better, didn't need to have further surgery. And if they needed surgery, then he went back and, and did the UU. Um, and, I, and I was interested because you did that, I, I, if, if that was done more routinely. We stopped doing that now. Now we don't do that extra incision for ectopic ureters. Um, 
but you know what we have now is you know you have the duplex system you have no function in the upper pole but you know i would really tell you and i, I honestly believe this that my data shows that upper pole function has no bearing on the outcome of a uu I just believe this, that if you have a dilated upper pole ureter and you're lucky because on the, re, on the I was afraid you'll show me a VCG with reflux into upper and lower pole both. Then it's like, okay, should you do a UU if you have reflux in the lower pole? I do. What I do is I do a extra vesicle reimplant of the lower pole and then proximal, I do a UU. Now, some might say, boy, you're really messing with that lower pole ureter. Not only have you mobilized it, done a reimplant close the bladder, and now you're making an incision and doing a UU. I don't have 50 patients like that, but we have about 10 patients and they've done well with having a UU and a re-implant. So I am doing that for those patients. In this patient, you don't have any reflux in the lower pole. So I would go ahead, don't worry about the upper pole function, do uh, stent the lower pole, do a UU, uh, and uh, I think you'll end your problems. I'm really hopeful that the UTIs will go away. Okay, so, and, and uh, the, yeah, sorry, sorry, Mustafa. Basically, I mean, the, the, the incontinence was, was the main issue, given that she's six years old and she's, she's a late presentation, Prof. Shukla. Yeah. So that, that, that I'm assuming is going to say, I mean, is going gonna, is gonna to solve that problem as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and there it is. You did it. How was it? How are your results with that? I want to know, Mustafa with uh, lap urethral. Yeah, fluid. it's actually a case of my, one of my colleagues who uh -huh. was trained uh, in sick kids. And, yeah. Uh, he underwent uh -huh. uh, lab urethral clipping. Uh -huh. uh, 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 I think uh, there was the ultrasound um, uh, bosob. Um, I, I'm not sure because this was done recently, so we don't have really okay. uh, a yeah. long follow-up, but her ultrasound was showing uh, that she she had uh, no worsening of that hydro uh, of that uh, upper moiety ureter with uh, but um, her symptoms um, improved but I, I, i'm not really sure whether she had complete uh, resolution of her uh, continence yet yeah because yeah. we uh, one of the question was whether this uh, incontinence was related to um, the ectopic ureter itself uh, or b b as part of avoiding dysfunction or something. Mm, yes, yes, complicated a little bit, yeah. right. Um, so yeah, no, you, you're right. I mean, I think the clipping should take care of the ectopic leakage, uh, yeah. but if you have a different issue, it's a different issue. I yeah. don't know, you know, we have to ask Armando for long-term follow-up on clipping. Um, you know, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that one. You know, I've done it, like I said, two times when it was a stenotic long upper pole ureter and those have done well. Okay, so uh, I think we'll move to the last case, which is case five. Uh, okay. uh -huh. It's four actually. No, no, yeah, the last case is- we'll Oh, the last case, okay. okay yeah. So because of the time. So uh, this is a three years old uh, boy. He is now three years old, but he presented initially for workup for antenatal hydronephrosis. So this is his initial postnatal ultrasound was showing uh, uh, a grade four right hyaluronephrosis with possible uh, doublex and a normal left kidney and uh, a urethrocele, whether it was a single system urethrocele versus uh, a doublex system urethrocele. And the bladder was empty actually, so this is the best picture I was able to, to pick. Um, this is his uh, he was discharged on prophylactic antibiotic and uh, no intervention at that time. He came to us six weeks later with this ultrasound that showed mm -hmm. uh, 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 an improvement of his right hydronephrosis uh, and the uh, presence of uh, probably either a, a, a pseudourethrocele or a urethrocele. Uh, also, no intervention. He came with a DMSA, which showed almost normal renal function with a little bit of reduced function on the upper uh, right upper moiety uh, uh, part. Mm -hmm. So this is his ultrasound at one year of age, showing almost uh, very mild hydronephrosis on the right uh, side. Uh, patient was asymptomatic, no UTIs, and 
This is his ultrasound at three years of age, which is almost uh, a normal uh, right kidney. So actually we brought this yeah. uh, uh, case to, um, uh, to listen to your comments on observational approach, but I think you, you, you elaborated it in your presentation. So if you have any more comments, I think I've said it, uh, this is the perfect one to observe. You did exactly the right thing here. Um, this is uh, one that can easily be observed for long-term. Um, the ureteroseal is nicely collapsed. This one might do very well. I would uh, just say, don't just say, you know, bye, have a great life. These are the kids I would keep in my practice, you know, every one or two years, come back for a quick ultrasound. I, in my practice, have incised in the last 10 years, uh, maybe uh, five patients uh, for a um, single system ureteroseal who came back with, you know, teenagers with pain, funny things, stone, um, an infection. So it can happen, but the overall, I don't have a numerator, you know, I mean, I don't have a denominator. I only have a numerator. So, you know, how many are out there that we don't even know about? But I would do exactly what you have done here. If you're gonna watch anyone, this is one that you should observe. So I think it's perfect management. Very good case. Okay. <laughs> Very good cases overall, excellent duplex cases. <laughs> well okay. done. Uh, yes, sir, would you please uh, do the closing remarks, please? Oh, absolutely. Dr. Shukla, I mean, we cannot uh -huh. say thank you enough uh, you know, honestly, I mean, for your time, first of all, uh, I know it's a Saturday, probably it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's an off day for you with the family, but uh, you've been, you know, give us some of your generous time. Uh, the feedback here is, 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 is tremendous, actually, and everybody is, is actually overwhelmed with the, with the beautiful information you gave us today. We would really, again, like to thank you, first of all. Second of all, we uh, are asking you for another one at some point. Hopefully, we will find a nice topic. Would like to have you again with us, and uh, please stay safe. Thank you very much uh, again for for your participation with us. Uh, very very generous. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Very kind words. Thank you. I've always enjoyed my interactions with your society, with uh, Saudi pediatric urologists in general. And uh, you know, I, I had planned to come. I think a year or two ago. Someday we will meet. But I hope we'll meet you all in Las Vegas. Uh, and. Uh, Please let me know if you're coming and we'll make a chance to. to oh, absolutely. And well, believe me, we all of us have deep wallets now with the COVID thing. We have not been spending much. So yeah. the pockets are deep and we're coming down there. You know? All of us. For, <laughs> yeah. Well, Mustafa yeah. and I actually just do the slot machines. That's it. Nothing much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, I'll leave all you to that one. All, <laughs> exactly. Indeed, indeed. We hope to see, all, you know, kidding aside, honestly, we, we really want to meet you. I mean, in, 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 I mean, we'd like to have you here in Saudi Arabia at some point. Hopefully yeah. when this, you know, mess is settled, settled down, then, you yeah. know, we will be very happy to have you in one of our meetings here in Saudi Arabia. As Joe Biden said, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, indeed. Inshallah, indeed. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, you very awesome much, Prof. Again. Thank you very much. For your uh, presentation, for your um, elegance, and uh, thanks to all the attendees and uh, participants. Uh, it was a very fruitful uh, meeting, and uh, thank you all. So I hope to see you and uh, soon and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Same very much. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye.